Hey class, today's topic is going to be uh, our cell division and DNA notes part three. We're going to continue to look at DNA uh, and really how it's structured and its role in making proteins, which is its purpose, um, and these processes down here, replication, transcription, and translation over the next uh, three sets of notes. So to begin with, we do a little bit of history of, of DNA, DNA and its structure. Uh, these scientists, Watson and Crick, developed the model of DNA structure that we have a, a pretty modern under, understanding of today. Uh, these guys basically said a couple of revolutionary things that helped us understand how DNA was structured and therefore a little bit more about its function. Uh, they said that the strands are complementary, which is important. It means they fit together and they're opposite of each other. So one is going to run in this direction and the other one, the other strand, is going to run down in the other direction. We'll refer to these things as five prime and three prime, um, and the, those run opposite. So you may see this in our notes here a little bit later, the idea that if they run opposite, then the three prime end is there, and then the five prime end is there. So they're uh, anti-parallel and complementary, which means they fit together. Um, also, the shape is a double helix, so anytime you hear that, ask in class, what is DNA like? It's a double helix. It's basically two strands that run in this opposite direction, and then they twist around each other. So you can see this, how they wind like a twisted ladder or a staircase, uh, just like that. Next, we're going to look at uh, all the details of its individual structure. So aside from the, the big molecule, the long strand of DNA, uh, what is DNA actually made up of? and it's three major parts. Uh, first of all, we do need to highlight what it stands for. It's important to know that DNA, uh, we'll say DNA all the time, but the idea that the D, the N, and the A come from its longer name, deoxyribonucleic acid, is important, and you should be able to say that word and understand that uh, it is more than just the three-letter name. <clears throat> uh, what does this molecule do? It stores all the genetic information. So we talked about genetic information being contained in the nucleus when we talked about cell parts, now we know and have a name for exactly what that thing is, that DNA that's stored in there and its purpose, which is making all the proteins. So DNA is the information, proteins are what makes us up, so we need some information, some instructions to make up all the things that we are and all living things are. Uh, DNA is made of nucleotides, all right? So this term here, nucleotide, is important to know that's the monomer or the building block of DNA. Uh, what it's made up of are these three parts over here. So we have a nice diagram. Uh, we have a phosphate group. Our phosphate group is uh, usually drawn orange or red in most diagrams. So the phosphate's right there. Um, the phosphate makes up the backbone. Uh, and then next we have a sugar. All right, the sugar is the deoxyribose is right there. Uh, this is a carbon-based molecule, so this deoxyribose is, uh, has a five carbon thing, which is why we get that pentagon shape there. And then our last piece is going to be the base, which is something we'll talk more about, um, the different bases that exist. However, our base here is adenine. Uh, there are the others we'll get into in a second. And then these are all bonded together. So we say there's basically three parts of our nucleotide. Here's the whole nucleotide structure in yellow. If you're able to kind of diagram it, this is usually what we do. The phosphate represented as a circle, uh, the hexagon, or sorry, pentagon shape, and then the, uh, the base attached to it. Um, each nucleotide differs only by the base. So you can see that the rest of the molecule or the rest of the, uh, the uh, nucleotide is the same. So if you see this right here, this whole section right here, all of these things, the sugar and phosphate, represents the backbone of the molecule. And the only thing that's different in each one of these nucleotides is the base. So this is our, uh, our sugar phosphate backbone. All right, and uh, that's an important term to know too, is that the rest of this is all the same. So our sugar phosphate backbones there. And the bases are A, G, C, and T, adenine, 
guanine, cytosine, and thymine, uh, and a little more detailed structure of the bases is there. So base pairing rules, we have to understand that uh, there are rules in how these bases pair together. Remember, it's not just one side of a molecule that we're looking at. Now we have to look at both sides, because we said they're complementary and they run uh, kind of opposite of each other. So looking at two strands here, here's two strands or two sides of DNA, and then we see that they are going to pair together. So these are the bonds there, we'll call those H bonds or hydrogen bonds here that stick these two bases together. So our base pairing rules, A always binds with T, so A goes with T, and then C is going to go with G. And uh, Shargoff's theory basically says that how many ever A's there are in a molecule is equal to the number of T's because they have to pair with each other. Um, hydrogen bonds are going to stick them together, and like we said, the two sides, remember, uh, one might run this way, and one might run this way, uh, but the bases are going to pair together accordingly with those H bonds and stick them together. How many G's there are equals how many C's there are. And how many A's there are equals how many T's there are. That's all Shargoff's rule is saying. So process of DNA replication. We have the structure. The first process we'll talk about in the cell is replication. Uh, we mentioned that in the cell cycle it was the S phase, the synthesis phase right here they're highlighting, that replicates our DNA in the nucleus. All right. So basically we're saying DNA is going to be copied. So DNA times 2 in this process, in the S phase or the synthesis phase. Um, replication. This process is important, so we'll go into a little bit more detail um, in the cell cycle. Uh, the first step, I'm kind of breaking into three simple steps here, is that helicase is an enzyme that unzips the double helix. So if you see this happening here, uh, what happens is we have a nice twisted ladder shape or double helix molecule, and then we see this big blob jump on. So here's your blob right there. This is helicase. There it is, running away from us. And what it's doing is it's jumped onto the DNA strand, it's unzipping it, it's separating the two strands uh, in half, creating this little replication fork, which is the point at which they, they split. Now this is going to be important if we want to copy the molecule, and you'll see how that has an impact in a second. Step two, I'm looking at step two, uh, we have new bases being added according to those same base pairing rules, A's and T's and C's and G's. Uh, the molecule that jumps on here is another enzyme uh, called DNA polymerase. Um, and uh, DNA polymerase is basically, we're simplifying it here, but basically DNA polymerase enzymes are going to be uh, enzymes that are going to stick uh, nucleotides together to produce a new strand of DNA. So these other blobs that jump on here and look like they're chewing these bases together are basically sticking all these free nucleotides here onto the molecule and creating another strand of DNA or pairing it up. Uh, step three in this process is going to take the two identical molecules and, um, and finish them off all the way fully and completely. Um, what that means is that by the end of this process, the DNA polymerase move all the way to the other side. There'll be uh, one old strand paired with one new strand. Uh, this process is referred to as semi-conservative. The reason it's semi-conservative is here's the, the, uh, the old strand here in the blue. So this is the one that we would be, uh, helicase would be breaking apart this way, and then DNA polymerase would be adding bases to along the way. So our old strand is blue, and basically this is the original, and then um, DNA polymerase starts adding bases to create this new red strand. By the time we're done, there are two matching molecules of DNA, but one has an old strand and one has a new strand, and that's what always says that those are semi-conservative 